First up is an urban legend that I've been dying to talk about for a while now, and that would be Shin Megami Tensei's boot up glitch easter egg. As the story goes, there's a hidden easter egg within Shin Megami Tensei for the Super Famicom. Apparently, if you restart the console a certain amount of times, the boot up screen, while normally showing the Atlas logo, would instead give you this. Japanese on screen apparently reads, turn the game off now. To be honest, this sort of easter egg kind of seems on par with Shin Megami Tensei thematically, what with the game being about demons and ghosts, possessions, humanity, and a bunch of other wholesome values. In a way, SNT is kind of like a light horror game with heavy RPG overtones, so it would seem fitting to see this happen. Unfortunately, there's a lot of speculation whether or not this easter egg is real. For starters, many programmers and people with general know-how on video games and gaming tech have already spotted out how the Super Famicom isn't really capable of keeping track on how many times you restart a game, nor can the cartridge itself do that. Secondly, many have pointed out a ROM hacker by the name of Gideon Z, who has already debunked this as he's dug through the game's files as he was programming the English fan translations and found no such thing existing within the game's code. However, counter arguments have been made against these claims, stating that this easter egg only happens with pirated versions of the games, and that the only people who could see this are people who bought the game within its launch window, as later versions of the games have removed this little easter egg. Others have also stated that while the Super Famicom itself has no way of generating random values on a hard boot up, soft resetting a Super Famicom is different, and it can create arbitrary values for the easter egg to work. The truth is, many people will be speculating whether this is real or not until someone finally finds a day one Shin Megami Tensei copy of the game, which is hard to find because, well, it's not like day one cartridges look any different from any other versions. Maybe the serial number would be different? I'm not sure, honestly. Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. My personal take? Well, I think any sort of excuse as to whether or not this is an easter egg is real or fake or not is nothing more than just that, just an excuse. It's just too convenient to have all these answers as to why the easter egg isn't real, as opposed to the more logical sounding debunk. Frankly, I trust a guy who dug through the code for the sake of making a fan translation over some people speculating this stuff on the YouTube comments. Next up is the fabled origins of Jeff the Killer, and no, I'm not talking about the creepypasta, I mean the image. Now, I do have to warn you, I will be showing the face of Jeff the Killer on the video, and I, I, I know, it's silly to a lot of you. It, a lot of you might think that I don't even need to give a warning that I'm about to show Jeff the Killer's face throughout this entire thing. I know, I know. But trust me, I know a lot of people personally that have told me that the image itself is super horrifying and stuff like that really creeps them out if they don't know, so I'd rather y'all don't have panic attacks while watching my videos and I don't feel good about that weighing over my conscience because I'm a selfish person. Anyways, supposedly this video called NNN Temporary Broadcast, as it's translated over from Japanese, was the first instance of this image popping up on the internet. It was originally posted on August 2nd, 2007 on YouTube, but knowing that Japan prefers to use Nico Nico instead, I'll assume that it was uploaded just before this as well. The video itself, well, unfortunately, I can't really tell you what it's about because uh, it's Japanese. Which, by the way, after last week's video, I have had a number of you tell me that you would love to be my Japanese translator for later videos, and I I'd be happy to add you. Just join my Discord server and DM me there. I I'd be happy to have anyone who's willing to translate anything I find, because trust me, there's a lot of stuff that I find from other countries, and I have no idea how to translate because I don't know. <laughs> I don't know anything about like other people's languages other than Spanish and English, so yeah, please help me out. Sadly though, I didn't reach out to any of the translators for this video because quite frankly, I just don't think that that's what's so important about this video. Although I would love to talk about it if it is interesting enough, but what I do wanna be focusing on is the Jeff the Killer image.
Supposedly, this video is where it all started, but did it really? Well, there's a lot, and I mean a lot of controversy and arguments about this being the true origin of Jeff the Killer's image. The true story, according to some, is that this image is just a photoshopped image of Katie Robinson, a girl on 4chan who allegedly asked for people to compliment her and showed the original image of herself on the message board. Of course, 4chan being 4chan, the girl was ridiculed and harassed for showing her own image with people calling her awful names and just downright being awful towards her. Apparently, after all that ridicule and hate, Katie Robinson committed suicide. And this suicide theory has been bounced around from many different places, and at first, many people thought it was because of Cesar, or Cesoir, I'm just gonna call him Cesaron, the creator of Jeff the Killer, as it was believed that he was the one that photoshopped her image, which he already debunked on an interview with Scare Theater. Apparently, it's a photoshop of a white latex mask, yet the original photo still can't be found, so Cesar, despite being the creator of the story, can't really be a reliable source on the image as he isn't the creator of the image. Also, the story of Katie Robinson being a bullied girl on 4chan might have also been a complete fabrication of 4chan itself, as the users there are known for making up disturbing stuff and all around shitposting lies. When reverse imaging this photo of quote unquote Katie, we find out that it's actually a woman by the name of Katrina Mia, who was last seen logging on a dating website in 2011, way after she supposedly killed herself. But thing is, this gets a little deeper when you realize that that's not even Katrina either, but instead a woman by the name of Heather White as seen on a Christian website's hate mail. Random, I know, but it all adds up. The hate mail suggests that Heather was being called a quote, fat bitch by the owner of the website and goes on to ridicule the man behind the webpage. Then following this, we get another hate mail by Kim Workman who provided image of her friend Heather who was the one being mocked, not by 4chan, but by some random Christian on the internet. <laughs> I, I, again, it's really weird, but seriously, it makes sense. So she's not Katie or Katrina, but Heather, meaning she is completely unrelated to the Jeff the Killer photoshops. I mean, it, unrelated in the way that she posted herself, or rather she's not connected to that one story at all. And even if she was, she's only connected via image. It could have been just anyone that found her image and posted it on Fortune. In fact, it could have just been the dude that was ridiculing her in the first place, trying to get more ridicule out of her, posing as an insecure teenager. Now there is this post with her image on it, talking about how she killed herself after the ridicule, or rather it was her sister that posted that she she had killed herself, but this is clearly just bait or just a shit post, honestly. The picture might have even gone back further than 2007, as some claim that the original image could have been found circulating around 2004 to 2005 on 4chan, but there's no evidence of this being the case, and before you ask whether or not someone has used the Wayback Machine to see if that's true, well, first of all, the Wayback Machine only goes back to 2005, and two, 4chan only archives some of the threads and topics that they have, not all of them, so it's not like you can just Google search the thread itself to see if it's still around, because it's not, and the origins of this image is still fairly unknown. We could take Cesar's word and assume he created the image, but again, he made the story a year after the supposed first sighting of Jeff the Killer's image, and there are reports of it happening years before he made the story, probably when he was still just like a little kid. And of course, if that's the case, then it's really hard to believe that he was the original creator, especially since this image was found on a Japanese video. So if he had made it, this image should have been circulating for a long, long time if even the Japanese people know about this meme. And the fact of the matter is, there's no evidence to show that he ever posted it before Jeff the Killer's creepypasta. And to definitively debunk that Cesar was the original creator of this image, here's the image found on the Japanese message board PYA.cc, posted back in 2005. Apparently this isn't even the first sighting of Jeff. This was. Honestly, the most plausible story seems to be the one about a girl getting bullied. I seriously doubt anyone died due to the bullying, but I'm not completely ruling it out as the possible origins of Jeff the Killer. As untrustworthy as anonymous sources from 4chan are, 
the fact of the matter is, many of them recall this thread actually existing. And a lot of 4chan memes back then circulated around the memedom of Japanese culture, so of course they could have been sharing it back and forth, but of course, if this originated in America, then why wasn't it more popular in America? Why was it more popular in Japan? Maybe this Jeff the Killer was created during the Japanese exposure of the original image, which was this. It's so very convoluted and it just keeps ping-ponging back and forth between this being a Japanese-made meme found on some random website to just it being some random meme found in a 4chan thread. It is so very convoluted and I can't find a source for either one. While I was ping-ponging between each theory of this being a Japanese meme or an American meme, I eventually stumbled across this image. And don't even ask me how, It's it, it was so weird. I found it in a 4chan thread talking about the origins of Jeff the Killer, and even the person that I found it from doesn't even know where it came from either. But when you really look at this image, it looks exactly like the Jeff the Killer image. It, it's the same setting, the same lighting, the same hair. It looks very, very close to an unedited Jeff the Killer. But the fact of the matter is, it's still unknown who this is or why they took this photo or or who took this photo or he, who even edited. I mean, there's so much, dude. I am running out of saliva talking about this, but it is a fascinating topic. Truth is, we might not ever know the origin of this photo or rather the pre-photoshopped version, but hey, at least we found the original video that first showed it, right? Well, well, who knows? This next one is actually a bit of a personal one. See, while I was playing the Uncharted Nathan Drake collection, which, by the way, sucks. I hated all of the games, except for three. That was, that was okay. I came across this weird glitch while playing Uncharted 2 Chapter 17, in which the level starts you off standing on top of the mountain. And normally, you're supposed to follow your good friend into the cave to do something, I don't, I don't remember. But instead, if you go off the mountain right at the very edge, you get this little glitch. What the fuck was that? I remember playing this game like around midnight and seeing that kind of creeped me out. Sort of like looks like something being censored out, which I, I know it's not, but I mean, what else could it be? If the map is trying to cull out Nathan Drake's dead body, then it would have just done so by making him disappear, right? And why would it even need to do that? See, culling is a common practice in games that helps save memory and makes the game run smoother. This is often done for any asset in a game that is out of bounds or outside of the player's views. But this? I, I, I mean, I just don't get it. Oddly enough, I've seriously never heard anyone talk about this. The closest I've had anyone actually talking about it was when Adam Plaza played Uncharted on stream and found the glitch as well. Uh, what the, what the, what the fuck just happened there? What was that in the middle of my screen? But that's about all that there's ever been. I'm not even sure if this is exclusive to the Nathan Drake collection or if it can be found on all copies of the game. If anybody in the comments is a developer or some sort of games programmer, then please inform me what the hell this is because honestly I'm just I'm actually just super fascinated by what this could possibly be because I've never seen this kind of glitch in video games ever. Jay Alley is a weird one because there's really not too much to go off when it comes to this little video. Payment four nine five nine three four one seven negative one one nine nine five four eight three six stigle. What you just saw is the entirety of this channel's sole video, and seems to cut off abruptly from whatever it is this person was going to say. It's a creepy video of what I assume to be a woman saying a bunch of numbers while wearing a white mask. After that, she tries to say something else, but again, the cutoff was just too abrupt to even fathom what she tried to say. 
Now, these numbers may seem arbitrary, and I'm not totally convinced that they aren't, but if you enter in these numbers through Google Maps as if they were coordinates, you would get some random location in the middle of the woods somewhere in British Columbia, Canada. The fact that this is in the middle of the woods probably stirs up a bunch of images and theories through all of our heads, right? From dead bodies to drug deals, maybe a portal to hell or a secret hiding place. Who really knows? Honestly, though, that might just be what this person wants for all of us to think that something creepy is happening there. Because let's face it, the person saying all this honestly doesn't sound older than 16 years old. I am legitimately convinced that this is just a teenager who really likes ARGs like Marvel Hornets and wanted to make their own. It's a popular trend amongst weird kids these days, so I wouldn't be too surprised. The description doesn't really help much either, and honestly, I don't feel like entertaining this one video too much. As I said, it's probably just some teen acting weird, as all teens do. Or maybe, just maybe, there's something weirder going on behind the screen. But probably not, because, you know, life ain't a movie. Okay, so this one's kind of cool. In Hong Kong, there's this one commercial that used to air around the 90s. It was to promote this transit line called KCRC. It's a cute little commercial with a bunch of kids playing and pretending to be one big train. All six of them seem to be having fun. They're, wait, what? Yeah, if you look back at the footage, there's actually more than what was originally shown at first. It seems like there were five, but in this shot, you can actually see that there are six kids. What's going on? Well, that's where this urban legend comes in. Supposedly, this commercial was banned from Hong Kong, and the rumor goes that most of the kids featured in this commercial all went missing, and one of them died after this commercial was aired, all because of this alleged ghost that appears during this scene. Now, we've heard this song and dance before with another similarly creepy commercial, that being of the Japanese Kleenex commercial. The urban myth with that was that, well, supposedly, the actress in that commercial died during childbirth and that her baby was some sort of demon or something. Also, there were many Japanese people who watched the commercial and immediately began calling TV stations, claiming that it was cursed and that it was singing some sort of German demon chant, even though it was in English. Yeah, I, I mean, it was complete bullshit. And so that must mean that this commercial is just as fake as well, right? Well, there is an inkling of truth to this, because this commercial was pulled down, at least as far as I know. Apparently, the rumors of the ghosts and the kids missing and one of the kids dying, I mean, they were so rampant that KCRC stepped up and just had to pull down the commercial from every TV station. Was it to avoid the true nature of the curse that was plaguing this commercial, or was it just to avoid controversy? Well, probably the latter. You see, because it got people talking, and even the people who made the commercial were so concerned for the children that they actually had to call the parents and find out whether or not if these rumors were true. Which, spoilers, all the kids were fine. As for the miscounted children in the commercial, no, it wasn't a ghost. It was just a misplaced edit that featured the original cast of six characters. KCRC didn't just pull down these commercials. They gathered an entire investigative team to find out whether or not these rumors were true. And of course, they're just not. This commercial had more than just five kids. In fact, it had more than six. It had seven children and probably even more than that. They were all casted for this commercial, but many of them had to be cut out from the original film because, well, they probably just needed five and nothing more, nothing less. But of course, this explanation didn't actually quell any thoughts, and so KCRC, the company this commercial was advertising, went ahead and released unused footage to prove once and for all that there was no ghost, just a few missing actors that never made it to the final cut of the commercial. And so there's the answer. Another urban legend of some creepy ass Asian commercial finally gets to rest. Finally, this one is again another personal experience. 
One night, as I was streaming creepy content submitted by you guys over on my Twitch channel, twitch.tv forward slash goose underscore boost, yes, this is a shameless plug because fuck you. In a brief moment, I caught this. I just fucking heard someone scream. I'm not even kidding. I just heard someone scream outside. It sounded like bloody murder. I just literally heard that. Holy shit. And yes, that scream legitimately came from outside my window. And before you ask, no, I, it wasn't some video loaded up on YouTube, nor was it any other applications on my computer. I heard it straight up from outside my window a few blocks down my apartment building. And if you really are that skeptical about me saying that, well, keep in mind, number one, whenever I do play videos on my Twitch stream, you would often hear the echo coming from my microphone and the speakers because, well, sometimes I forget to plug in my number two headphones, and if I had my headphones on, that would mean you would not be able to hear the scream at all. But the thing is, they didn't come from my earphones, they came straight out of the window. Now keep in mind, I do live in a suburban area right in between downtown and uptown, and it was a Friday night near Halloween, so it's totally possible that this was some partygoers going a bit too far with their shenanigans, but if my memory serves correctly, there were no parties audible from my neighborhood. Like, I couldn't hear any parties going on anywhere, and I live in a relatively quiet neighborhood, so I could have definitely heard any parties happening around me, even if they came from downtown or uptown. But then again, it's totally possible that it was just someone walking away from a party, or perhaps even a homeless person. Or, scary as it may be, it could have been totally possible that there was a crime happening right around the corner of my own home. And yes, I have looked into the local news the morning after, and no, I didn't find anything. I found nothing. Any possible crimes that might have led to someone screaming like that happened way, way further down where I lived, and I'm talking miles and miles. So that scream could just remain unanswered forever. So I've been meaning to talk about this game for so long, but I've never really had the opportunity to tell you about this. To be honest, even if I did have the time, I wouldn't be able to find much info, which is why it's here. There's a game by the name of Utahono Tatari. God, that was hard to say. Utahono Tatari. Utahono Tatari. Utahono Tatari. I got it. Got it. Alright, anyways. A classic indie RPG maker game that's way more popular in Japan than over here. That's most likely due to the fact that the game never had a proper translation. And if there is one, it's very hard to find because I had no luck myself. And because of that, finding out what the game is about is even trickier. Something about a young girl who lost her mother or something like that, she's traumatized, has to go to a mansion. It's hard to say. The game is an RPG maker horror game, a, a sort of subgenre in the horror indie community, often compiled of games made in Japan that are seemingly innocent, but devolve into something more sinister, all of them being made in RPG Maker, which is a fairly powerful tool for any beginner programmers that just want to make an RPG. Many different famous games have used RPG Maker. If you're thinking to yourself that you don't know any RPG Maker games, or RPG Maker horror video games, then uh, let me remind you, there are games like Yume Nikki, uh, Corpse Party, Ao Oni, The Witch's House, Ib, Mad Father, Angels of Death, uh, Hello Charlotte, Stray Cat Crossing, I mean there is a ton, it'd be very surprising if you've never heard of any of them. It is a very popular category, especially in Japan. This one, unfortunately, just sort of went under the radar, I think for most American fans. The game is just very similar to Aoni in premise, a young girl walking around a giant mansion with tons of monsters stuck in a basement, but the similarities kind of end there. Most of the game's scares come from the unsettling photos found throughout the mansion and a really creepy flesh statue that hunts you down all around the mansion. The game is split up into two parts. Our main focus will be on the second part because there's honestly a ton of hidden little secrets about this game that are fascinating, weird, and above all, creepy. One in particular is this strange glitch that occurs when you're walking around the perimeter of this shrine. <laughs> huh? 
はい何何何何何えええうわうわうわうわうわうわうわうわうわうわうわうわうわうわうわうわうわうわうわうわうわうわうわうわいさーです first on r slash creepy gaming from user you're not real he came across this glitch just when he was playing the game normally didn't really do anything spectacular or anything out of the ordinary but he just suddenly got this very creepy error message you just saw the only way he could get out of that screen was if he just exited the game which he did he first assumed that this was just part of the game, but apparently it's it's not. It was just a very random glitch, or maybe it was just a very random easter egg that the player somehow set off. When we see the screenshots posted by You're Not Real, we can see a few notable pictures. First is this jumble of letters that have no significance whatsoever. It looks like the game's trying to spell something out, or make something legible, but it's struggling to do so. And that's exactly the case. As later on, the poster then fixed this error screen by switching his system locale to Japan. At first, he thought it would fix the bug, but it didn't. It just fixed the jumbled up letters. As some people suspected, the game was actually trying to write out in Japanese, but just couldn't. Now, this was legible. Reddit user It's Rain Time, sorry, It's, it's Rhyme Time? Sorry, I'm not a Xenoblades fan. Anyways, he was able to translate what was posted on the screen. It's mostly a mess that doesn't make much sense, some creepy sentences thrown in with generic computer error messages, I think. Here's a quick and dirty translation. Please confirm. Location. Date. Utahan no Tatari 2. Severing the arm. The data is being damaged. Possibility is... Ah, please stop. Utano, I will kill you. Error frame process, can't really read because it's so garbled, 904, 239, etc. A system error is occurring. Your face around interior 3 is turning, warping, not sure about this one. The buttons inputs courage, 33333, confirm, GY, ampersat A, Utano, no, Shizumi, you are bad, could be evil as well, help, help, the writing is undergoing Read in testing 33333. Given the newfound context, it is very easy to say that the game is intentionally trying to scare you. That, or the creator of this game, had a very fun way of creating an error screen. The second part of this Easter egg that's really noticeable was the woman that shows up at the end. I don't care who you are, but if you saw this while playing this game in the middle of the night, with your lights off and nobody at home, you definitely shit yourself. This is a horrifying image, and while it's not totally random as much of the game uses real life imagery in order to spook you, the fact that this just shows up after a random crash screen, it would honestly scare anyone, especially with that horrible noise. What's worse is that she's almost, well, she just seems dead, like a rotting corpse with a contentious face. As far as I know, this image isn't found anywhere in the game other than during this error screen. It's unknown who this is, or whether or not this is an image of a real dead woman. It could be assumed that it's the body of the dead mother, but because I have no translation of the game, I can only speculate exactly what the game is all about, and whether or not this has any significance. Until then, this part of the game will remain unsolved, and honestly, I'm, I'm secretly hoping this gets enough attention to the point that someone out there makes an English patch for the game. I don't know about you, but this has gotten me 10 times more interested in this game I otherwise never would have known existed. So hopefully, someone out there can help us out, translate this game, and maybe, once and for all, we can figure out the mystery of this horrifying lady of this strange glitch that nobody seems to have the answer to. You know what I hardly cover on this channel? Paranormal shit. 
I love paranormality. I, I mean, I am obsessed with voodoo, black magic, ghost encounters, all that good shit. Sure, I might not be totally convinced that it's real. Hell, I hardly think any ghost video whatsoever are real at all, but they're still a lot of fun to watch. Some of you might already know about the time that I covered the ghost bell, a, a bell that seemingly rang by itself with absolutely no aid whatsoever. The ghost bell video is very mundane and lasts forever until the, the bell finally rings. For me, this has been one of the most convincing videos of ghost activity ever, and I still get messages every day by people who think they've solved the bell. One of the most common theories is the spirit bell magic trick. Basically, it's this magician's tool that is used to trick people into thinking that there's a ghost in the room while commencing a seance. With the push of a button, the bell rings by itself. That could be the solution to this whole thing, but the problem is the spirit bell looks very intricate and has a clear mechanism underneath when seen from below and has a very odd shape to it if it doesn't. Something which the ghost bell I covered does not have. There's no mechanism underneath and it's definitely not built like a spirit bell, so I don't know. Either way, I still wanted to cover some spooky ghost images that I thought was worth some coverage. Now, I am a skeptic at heart. Like I said, I can't be convinced so easily that something is a ghost video or photo. I say roughly 97% of ghost videos are just people pulling strings in this direction or that direction. Uh, notice how in every ghost video, things are always pulled in one direction. Like a cup always moves to the right but never to the left. It, it is always tugged this way or that way by the handle. Yeah. That's pretty sus already. Also, with programs such as After Effects being so easily available to get, people have gotten better at adding ghosts into any video whatsoever. And if not, well, just get one of your friends to pretend to be a ghost or pretend that somehow dust particles are orbs of spiritual energy. Now, while most ghost videos and photos can be easily explained by just saying it's dust or just pareidolia, sometimes there are just photos that aren't so easily disregarded. Take, for example, our main photo of the night found on r slash ghosts in which the original poster states that their photographer was taking photos at an abandoned psych ward. While at the nurse's quarters, the photographer took this very eerie photo. On the far left of the photo, you can see what seems to be a distorted person with an incomprehensible face. The photographer swears that there was no one with them that day and that this apparition has no right to be there. Now, I don't like to immediately believe someone's word when they say that there was no one there or that they had some spooky photo and it was only just them and their friend. Then the third person showed up. Ooh, Humans generally have a bad memory and often misconstrue details to better suit their narrative. It's what happened to this infamous photo of what looks to be an alien or ghost right behind this little girl. The person who took this photo, the girl's father that is, swore that there was nothing there. There was nobody there at the time. Yet with modern technology, we can see that the Martian now resembles a woman in address, which was then confirmed to be the girl's mother. Yet what's fascinating about this photo, to me at least, is just how horrifying the absolute terrifying face on this supposed ghost. Often when we see ghost photos, they more or less have that typical human-like face or something intentionally creepy looking. But this, this is eldritch horror kind of shit. Like my, my brain cannot process what I'm looking at. It's almost like as if it is a face, just upside down and just blurry. As you can see, what looks to be an eyebrow and an eye just above it. I, I, and you can even make out some of the details of the shirt this quote unquote nurse is wearing. Now, of course, when it comes to photos, it's always hard to say whether or not you can trust a photographer, a photographer who we know nothing about, nor do we even know if they exist. It could totally just be fabricated, a, an original story made by the Reddit poster, and the story itself could just be a total lie. Whatever the case may be, fake or real, this photo is amongst the most unsettling photos I have ever seen. Did you guys know that I actually ego search every now and again? Yeah, I got problems. But while I was looking up my own name, I found this one strange post on Reddit that mentioned me. 
Reddit user Pulpo Datin Tight. This I can't read. It's like five o'clock in the morning. Okay, give me a break. Now he's a fan of horror content, and apparently he's a fan of my videos as well. Thanks, man, or woman. You know, doesn't matter. You're cool. Anyway, apparently while watching one of my videos, because I'm really cool like that, an ad popped up randomly that featured a disfigured woman zoomed in real close while she was whispering directly into the mic. Now, according to Pulpo, the woman was speaking in Spanish, particularly Spaniard Spanish. It shocked Pulpo as their volume was set to high. That and they also have a sort of phobia for deformed faces. The ad itself ran for about a minute or so, but it is implied that because the audio was loud and the face was creepy, Pulpo noped out of there real fast. After all, you can skip most ads, especially ones that are very, very long. Now, it's easy to assume that because they were watching something spooky, it would obviously lead to spookier ads. YouTube, after all, has a targeted ad system, which goes through your browsing history as well as what videos you tend to watch. What's really disturbing, however, is that it followed Pulpo to another video, but this time while they were watching something cute. Now, of course, watching one cute video obviously does not suddenly shift YouTube's personalized ads in a minute, but the fact that they saw it again is still pretty disturbing. The ad is also relatively long, about a minute or so. If we had known what exactly this ad was trying to portray or sell, then hunting down the video would be a breeze. But that wasn't ever mentioned. I have mentioned Popo about this ad asking if they speak Spanish or is a native Spanish speaker, and if they remember what exactly the ad was saying. The only thing we can get out of this post was this crudely drawn interpretation of what the ad might have looked like. In it, we see this disfigured burnt lady in a dark room with a microphone, and whether or not this was supposed to be ASMR is still a mystery. Hell, to be honest, this might not even be an ad aimed at selling anything at all, but rather some strange channel that was promoting itself. That is, after all, very possible. I remember a few years ago, Poppy was making ads on YouTube about her channel, only they weren't videos specifically made to be ads, just random videos from her channel promoting itself onto other channels. And you see that nowadays too. I get my odd share of ads that are made directly by YouTubers who have like less than 2,000 subs, but still want to advertise their channel. With enough money, it's even possible to have hour-long episodes of a show online to be an ad, which is super obnoxious, especially if you're someone like me who likes to leave their TV on with YouTube in the background when you sleep at night. Trust me, Waking up to an obnoxious ad featuring someone's stupid Let's Play compilation of them screaming over scary games is much more frequent than you think, but I'm getting off track here. In the end, it's up to you, the viewers, to tell me if you've ever seen this ad, especially to my viewers in Latin America, who I know love spooky videos. This one is a last minute entry. As I finished up my script and was ready to record, I was greeted by this message from the user RARXD on Twitter, telling me about a strange TikTok involving a woman in her car receiving a strange transmission over her radio. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute, that sounds kind of familiar. Hmm. So, Snackquarius is the original poster of this video, and since then, this video has already garnered over 800,000 likes and 23,000 comments in just a matter of two days. And here, of course, is the video in question. I hope it does it again. Am I fucking tripping right now? Ah, oh, what is happening? The attention it garnered brought on a slew of theories, as well as responses as to what this transmission could have meant. Unfortunately, due to the staticky nature of the broadcast, it's difficult to make out what the person on the other end is saying. Something about the time council, maybe time capsule? Several TikTok users have duetted with the original video, trying their best to decipher what it is this person is saying on the other end. Everyone who's responded has a slightly alternate version of what the broadcast is saying, but overall most people agree on a few key points. Whoever is broadcasting this message is in distress and is asking for anyone to help. 
there is mention of something revolving around time, either be it a time council or time capsule. Personally, to me, it sounds like time capsule, which if you don't know, it's basically like a loot box that's only going to open a few years from now. Look, I tried Gen Zing that definition of time capsule because just, I, you know, we're talking about TikToks. Most of you are Gen Z. How'd I do? Anyway, it also seems that most users also agree that the voice said something or someone has escaped and is currently in pursuit of this particular person. Afterwards, there are numbers being spouted out, the numbers which cannot be unanimously agreed upon. Finally, it ends with this, please hurry, I don't have much time. The broadcast then suddenly ends. Now, as I said before, with the massive amount of popularity this has gotten, many have wondered what it is, where it's from, and how was this even discovered? Obviously, there will be people who will say it's a hoax, that this person is just clearly making it up. But I kind of don't believe that. Weird transmissions can be picked up by absolutely anyone. You don't even need to be a tech expert to accidentally stumble upon these radio frequencies, which, while aren't as plenty as maybe back in the 80s or 90s, can still be found every now and again by anyone with a car radio. Just take my previous venture with another freaky radio broadcast, one I affectionately called the Crying Radio Man. At the time, it was unclear to me what exactly was going on. A crying man over the radio? Was it some sort of hoax? An ARG? A callback to an old radio station that was supposed to be haunted? Well, while it's not 100% confirmed, I have made an update video since then where I stated that it was most likely a case of a bad radio interference. See, as soon as I found out that the crying radio man came from a specific movie called Suntan, which was suggested to me by a certain user, I totally forgot your name, but thank you so much, I love you. In Suntan, there was a man who cries towards the end of the film. I won't describe exactly what happens at the end that made him cry, mainly because it might get me in a bit of trouble, but also because, you know, don't want to spoil the movie, and uh, really, if you want to know, just click on the video on the corner right there, top right, just click there, and you can be sent over and you can find out exactly what the crying is all about. But back to this one video here. Knowing all of what I just said, I think it's safe to assume that it might be what's happening here. We can't really be too sure, can we? The only way we can find out whether or not this was interference from a different radio frequency is if we can find the source of the transmission. If we can find out the source of the transmission, maybe we can find out exactly why it was played. Yet, as fun as it is to think about all the possibilities that this could be a time traveler coming to warn us about some horrible future event, Let's be real, it isn't, and we already have an update as to what it is. In fact, I'll just let Snackquarius go ahead and tell you all what actually happened. Hello, for anyone who wanted an update in regards to the radio situation, um, the radio station Fine Music Sydney have released a press release or a media release on their website, uh, and it is confirming that it is in fact the escape rooms audio that was playing on my radio whatever reason so if that was your guess um you win a gold star and i don't know very snaps for you babes um if you are wanting to read the press release just look up fine music sydney it's on the website but yeah thanks for coming along for the ride babes i know it's a bit anticlimactic but that is the point of many mysteries it's all just a bunch of mysteries that i either can't solve am unable to solve or have already solved but i just really want to share this with you. I think personally it was a really funny idea to think that maybe this was some mysterious time traveler, but radios are a very finicky thing, and they could just sometimes pick up some weird shit that, well, nobody really asked for. Taiko no Taitsujin, I hope I said that right, is a rhythm game in Japan whose name I'm sure you're not familiar with, but you are familiar with these kinds of videos of just Japanese dudes absolutely rocking these drums and being massive cool bros online. Holy shit. It's a wildly successful series with game after game, spin-off after spin-off, port after port, etc, etc. The latest rendition, Taiko no Tatsujin Drum and Fun, is one of the rare occasions of the game being translated and shipped worldwide, and me and my two-year-old fetus girlfriend can't be any happier for that. But just because we're all now seeing a larger growth in the game's franchise, that doesn't mean it hasn't existed in the past. There's an especially popular version of the game in Japan for the Wii, but 
but it isn't so popular just because it's good or fun, but because it harbors a dark secret that nobody has yet to decipher. The secret lies within the game's soundtrack. See, the game in question is Taiko no Tatsujin Wii 2, and on the surface, there are only 70 songs accessible to the player. None of them are really notable, I mean, they're great, but they're just mainly songs from Japanese media and pop culture, except, well, there is an additional song that can't be seen at all. Well, like, I guess in this case, it can't be heard? I don't know. Well, what I mean is there there is technically 71 songs within the game's data. The 71st song, however, can't be accessed through normal means. It's not unlockable, it's not a cheat code, it's not even really a playable level like every other song. It's just there, hidden. It can only be accessed either by the programmers of the game or by anyone who can hack the game and rip it of all its contents. When the modders of the game extracted it onto a PC, they found the 71st song, oddly named 1STPAI, or First Pi as it's often pronounced. The community was stunned when the audio was later uploaded on Nico Nico, especially knowing that it came from a very wholesome, cutesy, child-friendly game. This audio blew up and was immediately known by even people who aren't too familiar with the game. But, of course, this being a Japanese-only game meant that only in Japan did this blow up, so us Westerners, for a large part, had no clue what this even was, or that it even was a thing at all. Over there, however, it was a massive meme. I'm sure you're dying to hear what it sounds like, huh? I mean, this is a mini-mystery, it's gotta be kinda creepy, right? Well, up until now, I've been referring to this audio as a song, but that's not really the case. The audio itself is just a bunch of jumbled up noise with some wet footstep sounds? There's maybe even some Japanese people talking, splashed in between, followed by a remix interpretation of Mozart's Requiem Dies Irae. I'll let you have a listen, but be warned, it's really, really weird, so if you're not really into like audio spooky stuff, well, this is your last chance to leave. Here's the timestamp so you can avoid it. The audio lasts for about two and a half minutes, and what I've shown you is portions of the entire audio. It's not the whole thing, trust me, it's really long. Strangely enough, however, the audio itself has become somewhat of a meme online in Japan, often being accompanied by a strange smiling face of a man. I'm not sure if the person has any sort of significance to what this meme is at all, as it just seems like a sort of weird image used to accompany a weird track, most likely just spawned from the fun fact that if you bend a photo or poster or dollar sign in a certain way, it'll give you that person's funny little face. This strange audio, tucked away within the game's data, hasn't really been solved by the Japanese as to why it exists in the first place. There's some speculation that it could be some teaser audio or filler audio from a trailer to promote Bandai Namco's next game, whatever that may have been. Some say Yokai Watch, but I kind of doubt it. And there is one source I saw that stated Namco apologized to the public about the disturbing audio, stating that it was just test audio used in the game, well, to just test the sound and tracks of the game. However, this doesn't have any credibility to it because there's no link to an apology, there's no website that says so, and for sure there's no way I'd be able to find out now as this clip and the meme itself is over 10 years old. 
Honestly, it's hard to say if this audio is even really from the game. For all we know, it could have been just a hoax. Although, interestingly enough, one of the spin-off games on the DS does have an easter egg that does contain the first Pi audio. At least, a portion of it anyways. Have a listen. Obviously, this was an intended easter egg that anyone could trigger, so this time it wasn't hidden and was clearly there for anyone to find, unlike previously where it was just buried within the game's files. This could indicate that the audio was intentional, maybe even a lost easter egg that never made it to the final cut, however this game was made several months after Taiko no Tatsujin Wii 2, and it was around this point that the meme was spreading like wildfire. It is possible that the team was just in on it for the fun of it. The closest I've gotten to some validation of this even existing was when one of the lead programmers of the game, Tahakashi, on Twitter made a joke post on Twitter where he said he'd add only one requested song in the sequel, Mint Tears, a popular song from the series, or First Pie. I've asked someone from Taiko Timeblog fansite if they knew anything about this, but unfortunately, they just led me to their one and only entry into this strange song and told me that if I wanted more evidence of this song's validity, I would need to speak to people or communities that specialize in digging up unused data. I'm really not an expert on data mining or anything like that, but if someone could get their hands on a physical copy of the game and extract the files from that copy, we would actually validate if this really does exist in the game. But since it's a Japanese only release, it would seem that might be a little difficult. But then again, there are alternative methods into getting the game's data, i.e. ISOs, but I'd rather not encourage that sort of method just because I'm not sure if that's advertiser friendly or not. So I'll remain ambivalent and let anyone out there with the skills to do so figure it out for themselves. Still, whether this is a real case of a hidden easter egg or some strange hoax, the possibility of this audio existing in a seemingly innocent rhythm game is just way too freaky to ignore. TikTok is really proving to be an interesting hotspot for horror nowadays. I'm really not an active user as much as other people are, but the requests I've been getting through email and Reddit have been pretty much 40% TikTok horror stuff and 60% ARGs. But believe it or not, most of the ARGs are from TikTok, so sometimes it's kind of a mishmash between the two. This one, however, I believe is far more disturbing than most of those videos, and it just so happens to be one that I just stumbled upon by accident. TikTok user Savanella, CVnella, I don't know, was asked by a commenter what her favorite scary story or video was, in which she delightfully describes a specific video from way back in the olden times of 2019. Remember that year? Remember what life used to be like? Yeah, I don't either. Anyway, she talks about this one account by the name of hardboiledtoad.v4, a seemingly abandoned account with just one video, which to her was possibly one of the creepiest videos she'd ever seen. Be warned, if you're not good with spooky looking faces, this might not be for you. Timestamp as always is right here, though do keep in mind, this video is about one creepy face, and there are multiple times when I'll be referring to it on several different occasions, so you won't be totally safe from it. I'll try to use it sparingly, but you've been warned. I've been getting a lot of questions about my dog, Cracker. He's half Cocker Spaniel and Australian Shepherd. I rescued him. He's from Japan. Do you want a tree? Yeah? You want a tree? If you didn't catch that, by the way, I don't blame you. The first time it appears it happened so quickly that I didn't even notice it until my third watch, and the second time, for some reason, made the face look much darker than before, so I could barely make it out. Here's the image brightened up for you. That, you know, that way you don't have to change your settings. I gotcha. 
Basically, there is a horrifying demon face that appears within this girl's closet, and for some reason she claims it's her dog, or something. As you can see, that's, well, I mean, that's just not right. It's not just scary because of the horrifying face and that's right in her closet, but just the sheer strangeness of it all. Why refer to the face as a dog? Does the, I, mean, I don't know, dog have a body? And why just one video? It's accumulated over 6.4 million views as of the time of this recording. Surely anyone who's garnered this much fame would want to cash in on it, right? Well, if we pull back a bit, we can see that we're actually looking at the wrong account. Vanella claims that this is where she had found the video, and it certainly is really old in terms of internet years, coming from the Great Age, Stone Age of 2019. But this isn't where it all began. In fact, I can't confidently say where it began, but I know this isn't it. Pay attention to the name of the account. Hardboiledtoe.v4. As in version 4? Well, that's a start perhaps. So, what happens when we look for other hardboiled toes? Ugh. That doesn't sound right at all. Anyways, looking that up, we get multiple users, all named hardboiledtoe.v something. There's v4, v8, v10, v5, but. None of them seem to lead to a source. The oldest, as stated before, is V4 from 2019. The rest of them were made seemingly in response to the original video that made this account much more popular. Some of these accounts don't even upload anything, while others seem to add one or more videos that are part of this account. However, the more interesting account out of all of them is the one called HardboiledToe.v10. This channel hosts a wide variety of videos all about this one girl and her strange dog, and if you could even call it that. Each of these videos are strange, perhaps even stranger than the original, and before we dive deep into the specifics, I want you to notice the description of the user. According to the description, this account was made to re-upload some of the old videos that belong to Hardboiled Toe, and judging by the fact that these are all original videos with the same girl and the same face, we can only assume that this is the original poster of that one video. Oddly enough, if that were the case, then it only confirms that Hardboiled Toe V4 is just a copy, probably made only after the original page was created, and probably by someone else. With the newfound fame that this video garnered, we can also assume that this user is trying to reclaim that spotlight, or at the very least, sees that there is some interest in this potential ARG she created a few years ago. It's sort of like what happened with SNCH, where for about a year nobody really talked about these strange paranormal videos until a few users got interested and made videos out of it, which produced even more videos from the same user and adding to the mystery, etc, etc. This however doesn't add anything, more like bringing back the context of the video, so why don't we dive into some of these videos. First up, in this video that unfortunately has no audio where the user, Katie, is filming her bathroom in the dark, she turns her camera over and we see her dog Cracker just staring back at us with its cold eyes. Not much we can say here, but the change in environment shows that the face shown in the closet isn't exclusively to just the closet and it can move around. The next video is one where she angrily demands people to stop quote unquote sexualizing her dog. Here we can see the creature blinking its eyes at us, so any theories of it just being a prop of a scary Halloween head or Halloween decoration might be invalid, though this can still be the case as there are some Halloween props that blink and glow in the dark, though it does move oddly, almost like the face is being tracked or something. Yet if this is the result of face tracking, then why is the face so small? Why isn't it tracking Katie's face? Sure, it could hyper-focus on the person's face instead of her face, but even with face tracking nowadays, there's still an issue with stuttering and jittery face movements, so is it really that? It's also worth noting that the two places that this dog has been seen is in either the closet or under the bed, or honestly anywhere where it's dark. Obviously, this is done on purpose. It's clear that this information is just something she wants to obscure from us so that the illusion of it being a real monster is still there. Yet, the illusion, unfortunately, doesn't last very long. In this video, we see again Cracker hiding under the bed, but his face, well, it looks a bit strange, almost flatter, or tilted maybe. Katie then puts her arm in front of the Cracker. <laughs> That sounds... She puts her arm in front of Cracker, showing that the face really is there instead of it being just some Photoshop. 
Yet this harms the illusion more than it does help. This immediately tells me that this face she's using hasn't been a Halloween prop all along, but most likely just a face on a screen, like a tablet or something. I assume this because in other appearances of Cracker, the face has always been consistently facing towards the camera, yet this is the only time it seems distorted, squished, I, I guess would be the word. It's especially evident when we see Cracker in the closet. Note that the first time you see Cracker in the closet, it's just his face, but it seems a lot brighter, leaning towards a whitish blue skin tone. But then when we see the face again, the face is much darker, blending into the surrounding darkness, and its skin is leaning more towards purple. This could have been an error on Katie's part. Perhaps the screen was too bright at first, and after this cut, she dimmed it down to be a lot less scarier, or maybe a lot more scarier, or so that the tablet blends in better with the closet. Either that, or the tablet dimmed down automatically due to inactivity. It's probably why the face has always been conveniently placed in the dark, in shadowy corners of the room, or just straight up, just under the bed. I've seen one person within the comment section of these videos mentioning how it's actually a Halloween lamp, but I looked up Halloween lamps and I didn't really come across anything that looked close to anything that looks like, well, this. The only thing that closely resembled what they mentioned was this mask, and these are Lumen Corteur, or Cortor, I'm really stupid, please excuse me, LED masks that they're actually pretty nifty masks that display several kinds of images through the LED lights attached to the mask. They're pricey, but affordable for hobbyists, I'd assume. And you know, by the way, I'm not sponsored by them. They're just really cool looking. This could be what Cracker the Dog is, but the problem with this is that well, it just came out a few months ago, and this video, well, the original source, we're not sure when it came out, but this one in particular came out two years ago. So the timeline doesn't really match. Not only that, but the face seems far too small in comparison to the LED masks. And even if those two weren't the issue, like everything aligned, the timeline was there, the LED mask really is what it could have been, then we can't ignore the glaring issue that is that the fact that the mask has two eye slits, and every time Cracker shows up, he seems like a tangible face with no holes whatsoever or LED dots anywhere around him. So while I can't really say how she did it, I can definitely say it's not a demon dog for realsies. The eyes blinking and the mouth quivering is either something she animated or something she recorded. What I mean is Katie is most likely an artist who is very capable of creating a spooky face. I say this because this one video from a completely different TikTok user states that this is her concept art of Cracker, even referring to the creator of these videos by her real name, hence why I've been calling her Katie in the first place. But what exactly is the point of these videos. Is this some sort of ARG? Is there a reason why there's cryptic messages here and there sprinkled all together? Why the multiple channels? Well, I have a hunch, and yes, it's just a hunch, but I really think that Katie wanted a much larger story with more interactability. TikTok ARGs are very common, by the way, and it's obvious that she has a love for that sort of stuff, especially when examining this one profile called Dogcracker Point V2. It's got way more content and even reveals Katie's main account called Street Wife, but unfortunately it doesn't seem to be up anymore. In this profile we can see that she has a particular love for SCP-92. I'm also sure that these new videos uploaded since last month aren't just re-uploads but new content as well. Unfortunately we haven't seen anything in the past month and a half. All this said though, it's obvious the creator of these videos had some plans for this to continue, but ultimately it never got far, either because it never got the attention it deserved or because life got in the way. Yet with newfound interest in the videos and Katie's attempt to revive the project, I think, who's to say this really is the last we've heard of Katie and her dog Cracker? I would love to know more and see more, but at the end of the day, it's up to the creator. Judging by the fact that her mane seems to be just taken down, the fame, assumedly, might have gotten to her. Or who knows, maybe it's the start of something new. Pokemon has seen its fair share of terrifying theories since the very beginning. I think we're all familiar with classic ones like Ash being in a coma since season one, the Lavender Town Syndrome, Dead Trainers, the Pokemon War, and Cubones wearing their mother's skulls on their heads. Oh, wait, wait, that's real? 
What the fuck? Well, I guess creepy and Pokemon just go hand in hand. It's really no wonder when you have actual Pokedex entries like Cubones and dozens of others that are absolutely terrifying, if not a bit soul crushing. But that sort of added horror also brings along a sort of charm to Pokemon and makes it more fleshed out other than well, most RPGs that were at the time available. But with Pokemon seemingly embracing creepy stuff, fans too embrace the weird and cynical to the downright nihilistic with some of their fan theories, such as one popular dark theory that the Pokemon world is actually just Earth but in a post-apocalyptic aftermath and that every Pokemon is just a spawn of a real-world animal mutated by the fallout. You know, honestly, I just made that one up myself, but I bet someone has already beat me to it. But hey, speaking of nukes, one legitimately real theory that a lot of players, mostly in Japan, have thought up is the one where Regis are supposedly representative of the atomic bombs that were dropped on Japan. More specifically, according to the theory, they're a representation of Hibakusha. Hibakusha describes those who were directly affected that day when the bombs were dropped, be they survivors of either the Hiroshima bombings or the Nagasaki bombings. I wouldn't recommend googling Hibakusha if you're squeamish. Uh, I won't say it's incredibly gory, but the imagery is still pretty disturbing, and there's a lot of surviving photography of Hibakusha, their scars, their bodies, and art pieces that represent that day. This is a really popular theory among the Japanese community, and it's seldom ever heard outside of Japan. It's actually kind of interesting because it really makes you wonder what other kind of theories there are out there from different countries. Though, I'm getting off track here. For those of you who are unfamiliar, the Regis are representative of the legendary Pokemon trio Regirock, Regiice, and Registeel. And according to this theory, they somehow represent the nuclear tragedy that befell Japan. And yes, I acknowledge that this is a pretty absurd theory. Honestly, I'm really not the sort to make theory videos in the first place, but this one really caught my eye for a few reasons. For one, yes, we can acknowledge that this is a very far-fetched theory. Even if Game Freak gets a little disturbing with their Pokemon descriptions at times, they've never really done anything like this before, right? Well, maybe not before, but they did have an easter egg that, yes, actually acknowledges the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings directly after Pokemon's third generation with Pokemon Pearl and Diamond. According to Shiny Hunter Map, a guy who's really into Pokemon and hopefully not children, discovered within Diamond and Pearl's coding that players receive encounter rate bonuses depending on the day they play. Most of these days are attributed to positive dates or holidays from all over the globe, such as Independence Day, Hiramatsuri, uh, Christmas Eve, Festa de la Republica, St. Patrick's Day, hey that's my birthday by the way, they all receive 5% encounter rate bonuses, while days like Masuda's birthday, you know, one of the big main creators of Pokemon, and Tanabata receives 10% bonuses. Yet, there's this flip side to this, where players get a negative encounter rate for certain days. Now, at first glance, it's really nothing special. Yes, it's a bit odd that festive holidays such as Christmas and Oban get a 5% decrease, but maybe we can chalk that up to the developer simply wanting kids to enjoy the day and maybe not play video games? I don't know. But when you see what days decrease by 10%, you begin to think that there might be something to this Reggie theory after all. These days that decrease the encounter rates by 10% include New Year's Day, the Spring Equinox, the Autumn Equinox, and three that seem really out of place. And those are the Hiroshima bombings, the Nagasaki bombing, and 9-11. That is kind of freaky, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, yeah, a Japanese company acknowledging a Japanese tragedy isn't really freaky in itself, but the fact that it was coded into the game that these days specifically are days to avoid? Something about that is weird, don't you think? I don't know, maybe it's just me. I mean, it, it's not really like it's noticeable, which is probably why nobody knew about this, well, Easter egg, for about a few years. I mean, it was only just discovered last year. But could this mean that these Regis are also part of the planned design? If they've already implemented code to decrease the odds of encounter on certain national tragedies, Who's to say some Pokemon aren't designed by others to represent certain holidays and tragedies? I mean, there is one specific Pokemon who pretty much represents Christmas itself. But let's actually observe some evidence to back up this claim. 
As is true for the first four generations of Pokemon, each region is based on Japan. So for example, the Kanto region is based on, well, the Kanto region, the Johto region is based on the Kansai region, and the Hoenn region, where we find the three Regis, is based on Kyushu, a prefecture in Japan located in the southwestmost region. This is the prefecture where Nagasaki is. You can see the resemblance of Hoenn to Kyushu if we rotate the map in a 90 degree angle counterclockwise. Not a one to one comparison, but there are similarities. According to the theory, each Regis is located on the map where the real world equivalent of Miyazaki, Nagasaki, and the Oida prefectures are. Towns where aerial assaults and bombings were frequent, including, of course, the nuking of Nagasaki. Now, I've tried overlaying Hoenn with Kyushu while also including the Regis locations, and again, while not a one-to-one -one comparison, it's difficult to say this part of the theory actually aligns. Reggie Steel's location in the ancient tomb does match up with Miyazaki, sure, and Reggie Rock's location in the desert ruin, it's vaguely aligning with Oida. Reggie Ice's location within the island cave does not even remotely come close to Nagasaki, however. In fact, it makes more sense that the island cave's real-world equivalent would be Iki, and while I'm not too sharp when it comes to Japanese history, Iki just seems like the kind of place that would inspire a secretive video game island, but if we were talking about World War II Pokemon theories, while well, this was a place that was heavily fortified with coastal artillery during World War II, but you gotta keep in mind that during this war, most of Japan was fortified and weaponized, so it's not really a unique case. If this really did align with locations where significant bombings occur, then Nagasaki is left out, which, according to this overlay, would probably be Slateport City. So the theory's already a bit wobbly, but we're not done yet. The second part of the theory relies on the original Japanese text found within the Seal Chamber and Reggie Caves. More interestingly is the writing on the wall that said, in this cave we have lived. Yet in the Japanese version, it adds to the quote saying instead, in this cave we have lived and survived. The translations aren't wrong, because the phrase used is actually true, it's just a matter of context, though some players believe the context is meant to be interpreted to live on or survived. If true, it would almost make it seem like the people who lived within these caves did so due to harsh circumstances, maybe a huge war brewing or an end of the world sort of catastrophe. It also gets interesting when you read the entire message, and the people mention how they feared the Reggie so much that they sealed them away, much like how in real world nukes, they're feared by everyone. Then there are the bizarre instructions, which I won't read at all, but you're welcome to pause the video and read the instructions yourselves. While these instructions are esoteric and hard to interpret, many believe that this is symbolic of the day the nukes dropped. For example, the, the fact that you have to use dig represents those who dug air raid shelters for citizens in order to protect themselves from, well, air raids. Whale Lord and Relicanth could be representative of Fat Man and Little Boy, the names of the nukes dropped on both Nagasaki and Hiroshima respectively. And interestingly enough, when you follow the instructions, a violent earthquake occurs, possibly representing the explosions that shook the earth outside while everyone stayed in the shelter. After that, you'd have to wait two minutes to proceed to the next step, which could mean multiple things. The number two representing the two bombs that were dropped, or it could be a moment of silence for both Hiroshima and Nagasaki, one minute of silence each, with a new time, hope, and love aimed to the sky in the middle. This phrase would be interpreted in multiple different ways. It could mean, as always, to be aware of the skies for any new dangers, or it could mean to move on and for the new generations to live life with hope and love, unlike our previous predecessors who used hate and violence to get their way. At least, that's how I see it. Oh yeah, and we can't forget that the message are all written in braille, a method of writing used to communicate with those who are visually impaired, using their sense of touch instead of using their sight. It's always been very confusing to many players, including myself, as to why Game Freak used braille to encrypt their hidden message. It's not like we can touch the screen and feel the letters. Well, for many, this is symbolic too. Players believe that this is representative of the nukes dropping on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Those who were caught within the blast were either blinded from foreign objects flying towards their face or due to the heat melting their eyes off or their eyelids shut. 
And if the blast itself won't blind them, then just looking at the explosion will. Many people, including several people outside of the blast radius, were blinded by the impact of the nuke itself as it erupted like a miniature sun and burned away their retinas. These victims were blinded for life and had to learn braille in order to read anything, hence the braille used in game. Now admittedly, so far the evidence that I've shown is pretty speculatory, and honestly it doesn't really hold much weight. However, we've yet to talk about the Reggies themselves and how they fit into this theory, and trust me when I say things get a bit more interesting after this. So what's the point of the Reggie theory if we're not even going to talk about them? At all. Well, aside from their locations anyways. Well, I think you'd be surprised to hear that the Reggie theory holds more weight to its credibility when you actually examine the Pokemon itself. I mean, I mean, I guess that makes sense. It's called the Reggie theory for a reason. What a stupid thing. Why did I write that? Anyways, the first aspect of their design we'll look at is, of course, their character sprites and, believe it or not, their footprints. What could be so important about that? Well, if we examine Reggie Ice and Reggie Steel's design, the two seem eerily like that of a bomb dropping from the air and a mushroom cloud forming as a result of the explosion. Looking at the footprint, some players believe that the small little dot is the same perspective a pilot would have as they drop the bomb. It would get smaller and smaller until eventually it'd be nothing more than a dot. Then suddenly, it sends shockwaves across the land, which is what we see with Reggie Steel's footprint. Meanwhile, we have Reggie Rock, who I've left out thus far, but only because I've really been saving the most disturbing for last. Many players believe that Reggie Rock itself represent the Hibakusha, the victims of the explosion. Malformed, uneven skin, bubbling or oozing out of its body, seemingly mangled up and destroyed, much like how many of the survivors ended up during the bombing. After the bombs were dropped, thousands upon thousands of survivors ended up dying within months to years after the initial explosion due to radiation, and those who survived all of that ended up with permanent scars or burns or crippling effects of their body for the rest of their lives. The footprint on Reggie Rock looks seemingly like that of a bug. Some believing that this could align with the common urban myth that most bugs can survive a nuclear blast or the fallout that ensues after. Now to be fair, the footprint is widely regarded to be a reference to a certain type of beetle known as the sacred beetle. What can be considered a bit more credible, however, is the fact that the Regis are the only Pokemon to learn the move Explosion at level 1. This is the only move they can learn until level 9. This changed with Sword and Shield's release, however, and they can now learn Explosion at level 78, and their level 1 moves have changed, but for the past 15 years, they were the only Pokemon with this unique trait, solidifying the bomb theory even further. And if we're going to reach that far, we might as well mention that starting in Gen 4, each of the Regis could learn Hyper Beam, known as Destruction Beam, at level 89. Could this be a reference to the date when Fat Man was dropped on Nagasaki, that being August 9th? The most common format of date in Japan is the year followed by month followed by the day, so it could just be that. But with all this talk of nukes and moves, it, is it possible that the Regis could take it a step further and perhaps have a move that was a direct reference to nuclear power? Well, actually, yeah, there, there kind of is. Each of the Regis can also learn Ancient Power, which in Japanese is Genshi no Chikari, meaning primeval power. Yet what's interesting about that is that Genshi no Chikari is also a direct homophone of nuclear power. Meaning, while not spelled the same way, the two words are pronounced the same way in Japanese, fuck my phone. Now, there is more evidence out there to support this theory, but it's all up to speculation by the end of the day. I personally am convinced that somehow the original three Regis were some sort of allegory to war and military weaponry, but I never would have guessed that they'd somehow be connected to World War II specifically. It makes sense, after all, the legendaries are based on, well, legends and myths, but who's to say that should limit Game Freak's creations? Maybe there are other Pokemon based on war itself. 
As for the Reggies, are they also based on war by chance? I, I can't really say for sure, but I have heard that Reggie Gigas is apparently located near World War II memorials or somewhere in Hokkaido, uh, provided if we, you know, overlay Sinnoh with Hokkaido anyways, but I I'm not really familiar with Gen 4, so I can't say for certain if that is the case. As for Reggie Alecki and Reggie... Drake, I don't know who these, I've not played the new DLCs. Anyways, they're the newest Reggies as of Gen 8. Well, I highly doubt they're related to this theory at all. Not only are they not located anywhere in Galar at all, I also think they represent the Middle Ages more than they do World War II, especially seeing as how that's kind of the whole motif in Galar. Also, you gotta keep in mind that it's been 15 years since the original Legendary Titans were released, so bearing in mind that most of the newer games are being made by a new generation of programmers and writers, it's, it's really unlikely that they would team up with those people who made those theories or made those Pokemon back in Gen 3. But I could be proven wrong. Who knows? The lore keeps getting deeper, and the mysteries of this game remain elusive. We may never actually know the truth, but who knows? Maybe we're closer to the truth than we could ever know. In the years that have passed, mobile gaming has evolved from the old junk we used to play. Don't get me wrong, new kinds of trash appear on the app stores almost hourly, but I can confidently say that mobile gaming is kind of fun nowadays. I mean, yeah, it can be super mindless and incredibly greedy, but I found quite a few games I actually really enjoy playing on my phone, like Call of Duty, Shin Megami Tensei, Final Fantasy IV, or my new favorite, Cucks. Cucks. Kingdom Hearts. Make fun of me all you want. I, I come from an era where mobile games used to look like this. Ugh. Also, it's not like my 3DS is gonna get any love anytime soon, and I'm definitely not gonna walk around with this stupid big motherfucker in my pocket when my phone is already slightly more powerful and a lot smaller. Yet with the amount of praise I give the mobile market, I'm really not going to sit here and pretend that there isn't trash flooding the store every single day. And with trashy, over-budgeted, rehashed games come trashy, over-budgeted, rehashed commercials. You know the ones. Like those typical Chinese market trash games that come out of the woodworks with those horribly animated that's how mafia work kind of ads you see everywhere. It's not just one game either, there's like a ton of games that pretty much have identical commercials that, I don't know, I mean, it, it works though, doesn't it? it? You might ultimately not get any gameplay or understanding of what the game is trying to sell you, but it's just absurd enough that it becomes unforgettable. You might even be so curious that you'll actually click the link at the end. It's not like the game is going to be like that at all, it's, it's most likely a city building game or an RTS cash grab, but something at the back of your mind sort of nags you into doubt. And these aren't the only kinds of viral commercials either, there's also these weird ads that pretty much work with a shoestring budget that just highlight these outrageous choices you have to make in order to level up, or these hypersexualized commercials that border on being softcore and pornography, or how about that somewhat recent trend of mobile ads doing the whole, only 3% of people could solve this game, can you figure it out? Only to click on the game and it's it, it literally does not look like that at all. And it's definitely false advertisement in every shape and form. Holy shit, why are these still a thing? Though out of every single ad I've seen online, none of them, none of them could ever top the absolute maddening insanity that I'm about to show you. This ad, and many others like it, belong to this one game called Evertail. A Pokemon MMO-esque ripoff that's available on the App Store for just a dollar. 
Now, Evertale is not a small game by any means. If you go to the page store, you'll see that it's been downloaded over 1 million times. I've only seen bits and pieces of the gameplay, and judging by the game's ad itself, that sort of ambiguity works to its strong suit. Remember that this is a Pokemon-esque ripoff. As long as you know that, then someone out there with a dollar will think that it's worth buying. The game shows little to no info on what it could be all about, and sort of lets you fill in the gaps. Uh, what I'm saying is, being intentionally misleading is what this game strives to be. I mean, look at the description for example. Catch, train, and evolve 200 plus monsters. And then the next line, catch and evolve monsters. Explore sprawling landscapes, bustling cities, and mythical dungeons in this expansive open world RPG. That seriously doesn't even mean anything. That That's just a bunch of catchy buzzwords. Collect, train, and evolve over 180 creatures. Oh, so it's not 200 plus monsters anymore? Capture and explore, catch, train, and evolve around over 180 monsters and heroes. I think you get the picture. This description is just ambiguous enough that it makes you think it's basically just a Pokemon ripoff with some multiplayer element. And you know, for some people, that's just appealing enough to waste a dollar on. But in actuality, I would hold off paying even a dollar for this game if I were you. Because this game is practically betting on your love for popular franchises such as Pokemon and genres like Pokemon to be suckered into buying it. And nowhere can you see this better than its incredibly disturbing and kind of scummy ads. This is, without even a hint of subtlety, blatant false advertisement. It's probably the biggest lie any game on the App Store has ever committed, and I, I seriously mean that, at least on a big budget scale. We're presented these odd commercials that feature a pixelated game which many of us could assume is Pokemon. I mean, everything down to the overworld sprites and monster designs signify at the very least a strong Pokemon knockoff with a horror tinge to it. There's gratuitous violence featured in these commercials. Blood can be seen everywhere, cryptic messages scattered throughout the whole video, eldritch monsters haunting the player, and pretty violent imagery all throughout. It's pretty unnerving and admittedly a bit scary. I mean, honestly, if you saw these commercials and you just happened to glance at them in the middle of the night, you wouldn't really know what they'd be about. And for some of you who I know are very interested into the horror aspects of anything, you would probably want to buy it. Honestly, these commercials are really well made and they've definitely caught my interest had I not already known that these commercials were just a lie. These commercials are so weird and well made that more people are interested in whatever game it was supposedly advertising as opposed to this generic gotcha RPG or whatever. I've even seen some people claim it's actually an ARG that's hiding something because it's so well made. Fact of the matter is, it's not. This particular game, as interesting as it seems, does not exist. Nor is this hiding something deeper. It's just a lie. It's just scummy advertisement. Not a very good one either. If you just visit the game's page, you'll immediately see that what was advertised does not exist. Yet regardless, it works. As many reviewers on this page actually mentioned the weird Pokemon-esque creepypasta commercials. I'm sure some people might have thought the game was just keeping its creepy bits a secret too. You know, sort of like how Doki Doki Literature Club was advertised as a creepy game, but the store page doesn't even slightly reflect that at all. Again though, none of this happens. It's not even the same art style. Hell, even the ads alone go through several art styles. So how is it that the game could have such misleading ads without it being a scam? Well, it's not like it isn't a scam. 
it's the very definition of a false advertisement. But I think it's been so normalized that nobody really bats an eye to this sort of stuff anymore. To me, it's just confusing. Not just because the ads are so radically different, but because the game itself isn't even that bad. It has a lot of positive reviews, with a lot more recent ones being far more negative due to the false advertisements. Keep in mind, this is a recent thing. The oldest post I can find mentioning this was from around two months ago, which is around the same time I was also told to cover this topic. Their older ads were much more faithful, albeit, you know, typically horny as many advertisements are with mobile gaming. So I don't know. These ads are probably just nothing. They're, they mean nothing. Most likely they're just another ploy from another mobile game company trying their best to squeeze as much money out of their game because they've just realized their sales have started to peak. It's a shame, really, because they could be putting all that time and money and effort into an actual horror Pokemon RPG. I mean, seriously, I can't stress enough just how good this looks, if it were real anyways. I'd love to play this game. Hell, I I'd pay 10 bucks if this were a full-fledged horror game on the phone. Are you kidding me? <sighs> if only, right? In recent months, I have seen a surge of recommendations pointing towards this one ad. Or, should I say, a series of ads. See, back around 12 years ago, these creepy Japanese McDonald's ads went viral, and everyone had seen these ads at the time, and if you're not familiar, well, essentially, this series of ads are four separate commercials, all featuring Ronald McDonald in terrifying situations, such as him attempting to break into someone's home, or just casually hiding under a girl's bed. It's a strange portrayal of the otherwise heartwarming clown, but strange and Japan practically go hand in hand. Japan has a history of weird commercials, so it, it's no surprise that so many of us thought these were real ads, and I wouldn't be surprised if the people who suggested this video to me were also kids thinking this stuff was real. There's a whole new generation of internet users out there. Eventually the stuff I found creepy when I was a kid is most likely going to be regurgitated back on my lap. Well, I'm about to spoil the magic for y'all and, I guess, solve this little mystery. These are fake. And I think most of us can see that. Hindsight is 2020, though. A lot of us were dumb, idiot kids that believed in Slenderman back then, okay? It, it, lay off the new generation. But looking back on these, like, they're, they're so obviously fake. Like, it's so low budget and just... It, it really makes you wonder why so many people were fooled by it in the first place. I personally always knew that these were dumb parodies, but a shocking amount of my friends and people that I knew really thought that these were actually aired on Japanese television. I actually still think the running McDonald's one is funnier than it is actually really intimidating like it's supposed to be. Like, look at him go! There he goes! Anyways, aside from the looking fakeness and the clearly being a parodyness, we can also trace back to the video's origin to see who really created this. And sure enough, the oldest upload of this video was from Kikshin uploaded on July 5th, 2007. It's funny, it's actually not the most popular version of the upload, though that's not surprising when you consider YouTube wasn't really very popular in Japan at the time. So most of the views came from unsuspecting Westerners. Exploring Kikshin's profile, you can actually see that they've made dozens of prank videos and skits over the years. They were pretty active around the 2000s, and I don't really know if they work on anything now, but it would seem that they've kind of declined in activity. They sort of remind me of Mega64 and how they used to do social skits and parodies, you know, minus the game references. Anyways, it's interesting to note that among these parodies and skits is the returning character of Donald Jackie. Yes. You heard me, 
Donald fucking Jackie. Not Ronald McDonald. Oh, hell no. Nah. Nah, this dude would kick that smiling cunt's ass in a heartbeat. Look at him. He's taking on a whole row of Japanese dudes for no reason. Actually, no, there is a reason. It's the reason to fight. For what? For the love of it. What are these clerks' problems, anyways? Donald Jackie just stopped by a 7-Eleven and is getting brutally assaulted by these thug cashiers. I guess people really do hate clowns. There are other skits of Donald Jackie just walking around Japan, you know, shenanigans ensue. But I, I can't speak Japanese, so I can't really say what is going on. I, I can't understand any of it at all. I'm sorry, but this is as far as I can go. But in the end... While these commercials might have traumatized some of you, these are nothing really more than just harmless skits. Right? Right? I take a surprising amount of risks whenever I accept suggestions for future videos. Not to seem ungrateful or anything, without the suggestions you guys give me daily, I would really be unable to make half of the cool content you see on my channel now. And what I mean by this is, the longer I take getting to your suggestion, the more likely that suggestion will either get lost in the sea of emails, or they'll end up being covered by someone else. Or, in the worst case scenario, the video or content I'm told to cover is deleted off the face of the earth. That's what happened to one redditor suggestion over on my subreddit, r4 slash gooseboost by the way. User Meme Loop informed me of this horrifying Spotify account simply titled Zazumi. At first glance, it seems like any other Spotify lo-fi artist. The blue and pink retro colors, the small amount of listeners, and it's pretty ambiguous titles. If you were to see this, you'd honestly believe it's nothing spooky at all. Until, of course, you actually start listening to the audio, which I would happily show you if it still existed. Unfortunately, this suggestion was given to me four months ago, and I took note of it for a future episode. And that future episode is now, and Zazumi is gone. Everywhere. Now, I wouldn't normally make a mini mysteries episode on something that doesn't really exist, nor if I have little to no info on it. However, this is a special case because before this page was actually taken down for one reason or another, I actually listened to each and every one of these songs. Well, if you can call them that. In reality, each track isn't really a song, but rather prayers. See, the aesthetic of the profile would have you fooled into believing that this is a legitimate artist, but the reality is, each and every track were recordings from a mosque. I remember vividly that the audio was muffled as if stuffed into someone's pocket, and you could hear several people talking. Every now and again, the Imam reciting parts of the Quran as echoes reverberating within the mosque itself and his voice is echoing across the building now admittedly i am only assuming that what i heard was recorded prayers from a mosque i don't understand arabic in the slightest but when i did show somebody who i'm friends with who is a muslim they really couldn't make out everything this person was saying the audio is after all muffled as if stuffed into someone's pocket but nevertheless they agreed that this was most likely recorded during lectures and prayers. Now the question remains, why? Like I said, there's a handful of weird tracks out there on Spotify that you can easily find if you just dig deep enough. But the reason behind this profile page's existence really eludes me. It's one thing to upload prayers on Spotify, but it's a different level of weird when you consider this person has dozens of songs that are named as if they were supposed to be lo-fi hip-hop music. I mean, seriously, go on Spotify, look up lo-fi hip-hop music, it's exactly worded and exactly titled just like those songs. And let's not forget that they also have official album art for each album that they have. Unfortunately, I could only find one. Could it be possible this artist accidentally uploaded the wrong music files? Maybe even lectures from when they visited their local mosque? If that's what was being streamed on Spotify, then why and how did Spotify let this through? It's not just something you let go by. I mean, I've heard a weird amount of Spotify songs in the past, but this seemed a bit strange and perhaps even 
blasphemous. I have asked a friend of mine, Trey Watson, a musician who has actually uploaded on Spotify and continues to upload nowadays. Oh, and by the way, he's the main composer behind the Traumathon 2 theme, so give him a shout out. And I asked him whether it was possible to just let anyone upload on Spotify. And the short answer is yes, but it depends where you upload. Regardless of where you upload, however, anyone and everyone has the potential to just upload anything, provided you use the right service. However, this was irrelevant because Zuzumi wasn't just on Spotify, Zuzumi was everywhere. Now I've looked and looked and looked and unfortunately Zuzumi the musician can no longer be found anywhere online or at least their music can no longer be found. There's really only a breadcrumb trail left behind by Zuzumi, places where Zuzumi once uploaded but for one reason or another ultimately deleted everything. They were on Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Music, YouTube music jesus christ there's a lot of streaming services i really hate this deezer i mean hell if you search up zazumi on google you'll find their discography this artist existed but they're gone now what happened did they get banned literally everywhere did they delete every one of their songs I don't even remember seeing any other album other than Dreamer on their Spotify, yet according to Google, this person has multiple albums and songs all uploaded around 2020. There's even album art you can find online, like I mentioned, it, it existed before. Whoever this person was, and whatever their music meant, is largely a mystery, one that less than a few hundred people were able to witness. It's something I can't even describe. It's something that I want to find, but there's nothing left. And I really wish I could tell you more. And I, I, I wish I could just find something about this dude. But everywhere I've looked, he's existed there, but no longer does. It's frustrating, and I am going off script right now because it's seriously something I want to figure out, but can't. It's like having a Rubik's Cube that has one cube with literally no colors whatsoever. It's so frustrating, <sighs> but I'm never going to forget what I heard. This is a weird rumor I seldom ever see anyone talk about, but it intrigued me enough to talk about it. I'm sure I don't need to talk about what The Wizard of Oz is. It's possibly one of the most recognized films in all of human history, and I'm also certain that at least 99% of you watched it in school or participated in a school play or something relating to it. It's huge, much like the second key aspect of this rumor, Pink Floyd. Be it from your brother, your dad, Doug Walker, Jojo, or yourself, somewhere or another, we've all been exposed to the band and their music. I literally cannot condense their entire history and influence on the music industry in just a few short minutes, so I won't even try. Though, for the unaware, do keep in mind that Pink Floyd has a reputation for pushing the boundaries on music and the industry of entertainment as a whole. They've done several psychedelic experimental projects from tracks, albums, and even movies. They weren't a contemporary band that just played music, they lived the lives of artists, which comes wrought with both beauty and tragedy. With a reputation like that, it was no wonder that there were rumors spreading about by Pink Floyd fans about a certain album that allegedly eludes itself as an allegory for The Wizard of Oz. The theory goes that if you start playing the movie simultaneously alongside the album Dark Side of the Moon, then you would find several moments of synchronicities, as in the album itself would correspond to events and scenes of the film. When things got hectic, then the music got hectic. When certain key moments appeared, then certain sound cues would appear or even certain songs would reference the scene itself. Here's a good example. The very first time we see the witch in the film, not in Oz, actually pre-Oz, at around 8 minutes into the film, the witch can be seen riding on her bike. Normally, this would be the part where the movie plays her little theme song, and ooh, there she is, the witch. But with the album, you'll instead hear loud bells and clocks going off. In another instance, when Dorothy first meets the Scarecrow, the song Brain Damage begins to play the moment Scarecrow starts his song, which is about how he doesn't have a brain. 
The rumor started around the 90s when the Fort Wayne Journal-Gazette published a story by Charles Savage, who had seen this theory spawn out of a Pink Floyd news group, which I, I don't really know how to explain news groups, honestly. They're kind of like subreddits of the 90s. Sort of? Not really? I'm not sure. News groups were even before my time. They're old school chat rooms that... It's... 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 it's just look... just Google it. I, I can't... I can't even figure it out myself. Point is, Charles Savage wasn't the guy who made the theory. It, it was some rando online. He only just published the idea through a gazette. And ever since then, it's spread like wildfire. People from radio shows talked about it, people in popular media talked about it. It has a little bit of credibility, because Savage himself has experienced this, and he said it was a sort of eye-opener. Several scenes actually matched up with the audio, many lyrics matched with the actions of the characters, or even referenced them. The melody changes depending on the action taking place on screen. I gotta be honest, this seems very convincing. Especially when the Wicked Witch shows up in Oz and the word black syncs up with her arrival. Or when Dorothy and the gang run up to the door and the Wicked Witch's house, or her castle, I should say, and it slams in front of them. And that's when you hear all that you touch. And this is followed by all that you see shortly before Dorothy actually turns around and sees the witch. And of course, the final scene of the movie where Dorothy goes back home and the Pink Floyd song, Time, syncs up with the movie, Home, Home Again. There are several instances like this that happen throughout the entire movie, and of course you have to repeat the entire album if you want to see the synchronicities continue, but regardless, it still continues onward throughout the entire flick. And unfortunately, while I'd love to show you more examples, keep in mind that The Wizard of Oz and Pink Floyd are heavily copyrighted, so... Instead, I'll be linking a YouTube video of The Wizard of Oz in its entirety synced up with Dark Side of the Moon. Tell me what sort of synchronicities you find. Well, there's already a ton that people in the comment section have already claimed. Several moments of the movie sync up with the, the music, and some have even timestamped it for your convenience. Now, with all that being said, let's not forget that this is just an urban legend. The members of Pink Floyd have constantly denied over the years that the album somehow syncs up with The Wizard of Oz, with even David Gilmore claiming that it's the result of someone with too much time on their hands. But even if it's told through the band members themselves, many fans still disagree with them. I'm sorry, I just think that's hilarious. I mean, Christ, can you believe that? The guys behind the album, the music itself, say that it's not true, yet fans are not convinced. That's like when the US government disclosed actual, legitimately real UFO info to the public, and everyone around the world just shrugged and said, eh. Listen, logically speaking, this urban legend is most likely spawned from our brains, and I mean that literally. The human brain is really, really good at recognizing patterns where there are none. It does so every single day. We see shapes in the clouds, we find meaning in the smallest things, and we connect the dots when there aren't any dots available to us. That's just what makes us human. We're even so good at pattern recognition that we've developed in our brains a way to discard any sort of information that doesn't align with our current pattern. We are constantly curious, and seeing a few synchronicities in The Wizard of Oz and Pink Floyd excites us, as much as we know that it's really nothing special, nor does it lead to anything grand. I've even heard some naysayers stating that you could sync up any album with The Wizard of Oz that runs at around the same runtime, and you'd get just about the same results, and vice versa. Just play Dark Side of the Moon with any movie, like... I don't know, Batman or Shrek, there will be undoubtedly a ton of synchronicities. Go ahead, try it. I'm serious. Like, try it out. I'm sure it's on Spotify, their whole album, and just find one of your favorite films and sync it up. And I seriously want to hear your results. Put it in the comments down below. I'd love to hear what, what the results are. Regardless, that doesn't mean that this is any less fun. I mean, it, it really is fun to revisit a classic movie in a brand new light. Hell, why stop at Dark Side of the Moon? Just play your favorite albums with any of your favorite movies and you're bound to find something that syncs up with that movie. The urban legend has spanned for 
for nearly three decades now, and people have found different variations of Pink Floyd albums synchronizing with different movies. Famous vor fetishist Griffin McElroy has claimed that Dark Side of the Moon actually syncs up beautifully with Paul Blart Mall Cop 2. I've, I've even heard that Wally syncs up with The Wall, if you could believe that. As for myself, well, do I believe that? Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I, I don't think I do. I, I like to keep things simple in my life. Overthinking silly stuff is fun, sure, but I rarely take that sort of stuff seriously. I think Pink Floyd would have gone through several hoops and spent a lot more time than needed on the album if they really wanted to perfectly sync up with The Wizard of Oz. What's the point of slightly syncing up every now and again when they should have just gone all out and aimed for pure synchronicity? I highly doubt they'd waste their time trying to make music that syncs up with The Wizard of Oz for no reason other than to be, well, actually that just sounds like Pink Floyd, but I'm pretty sure they didn't do that. So no, I'm not a true believer of this urban legend, but I will say it's a lot of fun. In fact, if you could believe it, I first heard about this urban legend through the angry video game nerd. Yeah, seriously. See, I usually put his videos up in the background whenever I'm working as sort of, you know, background noise, and I remember somewhere around season three, the video's audio goes completely blank for like a solid minute or two, and a block of text appears. I always grab my remote and skip that part and went straight to the review without actually reading it. Well, this time around, I decided to read it, and <laughs> what do you know? It describes the entire dark side of the rainbow theory in detail. This isn't too surprising when you know James Rolfe is an avid rocker and metalhead who grew up with Metallica, Queen, Van Halen, Aerosmith, and of course, Pink Floyd. Well, what's funny is that in this very description, while explaining the urban myth, James actually hints at the possibility that this very episode syncs up with the dark side of the moon. Huh. Wait, that, that can't be possible, right? Well, there's only one way to find out. Most people don't realize this, but the most successful ARGs are often the ones that are worked on by multiple people. It's true, you know. Everyone likes to think that ARGs are the product of just one bored dude on a Saturday morning or something like that. But really, think about your favorite ARGs out there. Marble Hornets? That's a whole team of people. I Am Sophie? Yeah, that's definitely a team of people too. Sombra's ARG? Remember that one? The only ARG I can think of that recently came out that is pretty interesting and well made was the one designed by 2020 Vision, aka Weird Side. Yeah, side note, if you didn't know, the guy behind the 2020 Vision ARG has come forward to explain literally everything. He was kind enough to actually show my video in the beginning of his video montage too. Neat. Anyways, I I'm getting sidetracked here. Point is, even if you do it alone, there's a lot of work put into ARGs. So in many ways, it makes sense to hire a team to work with you on this sort of ambitious thing. Well, with that being said, let me tell you about this fantastic little ARG slash alternate reality thingamahosets that tragically was cut short due to some drama and infighting. This is the Mario 64 Beta Archive. It's a channel that arose during the rise of the Mario Iceberg, aka every copy of Mario 64 is personalized. To explain that briefly would only mean missing a lot of key elements, but to summarize, basically there was this creepy iceberg made on Mario 64 that showed the many cryptic secrets that lied within the game both on the surface level and on a meta level. It would eventually start to devolve into something more nonsensical, yet eerie all the same. Soon after this iceberg, many people started making creepy Mario 64 content. Some good, some meh. But overall, I personally really enjoyed this period of exploration. Bro, honestly, any time we're allowed to be creative and creepy just makes me smile and fall in love with the horror community all over again, so I encourage it, whether it be good or bad. None, however, put as much effort as this one channel, though. 
See, the Mario Beta 64 archive claimed to be this channel run by someone who got a hold of a bunch of cassettes, tapes, and project files from the beta of Super Mario 64. There are times in the description where we get the names of the two people running this channel, Meg and Eric. Eric being more central to the story as he claims to be a tester for Argonaut software, then later switching to Meg who worked on the GUI. Each upload contains either unused music, beta versions of existing songs, pre-rendered shots never before seen in public, or both. Rarely though do they show some gameplay from the beta, but we'll get to that in a bit. Now I might have already spoiled the magic a bit by admitting that yes, this is an ARG, so most of what you see, if not all, is completely made up. Yet if we were to look at this channel at its face value, the average viewer might not be able to tell whether this was fake or if it were real. The music composed for this channel is so convincingly off-tune and just slightly different that it would honestly make you think it could be a real beta song. Even the never before heard songs are convincing. What's great is that this channel went the extra mile to add distortions to the music, errors to the songs, and even the videos of the gameplay seem old and damaged. We haven't even mentioned the beautifully and masterfully done 3D renders that are shockingly realistic. Like, I can't even describe to you how incredible these renders look. Everything about them are like straight out of the 90s or even straight out of a gaming magazine. And yes, they even go to the extra lengths as to add a bit of detail into the renders to make it look like they were scanned from a magazine page. Clearly, whoever was behind these images were a master of what they did because seriously, these are so goddamn good that I'm almost convinced that they could be real. Like, I know they're fake, but I get nostalgia just looking at them, even though I, I've never been exposed to these images at all. There's a lot of wonderful attention to detail with each of these videos, and like I said, they're so convincing that I wouldn't be surprised if most of you thought it was real. But things start to get a bit more, shall we say, dark when you look into more of these videos. We've got your standard creepy anti-piracy video, sure, but the thing that really tipped this whole thing off was the developer animation showcase. Prior to this, however, the video developer crash handler showcased a beta version of the error screen, and it was pretty spooky, to say the least. It's me, Mario! Yeah, that's nightmare fuel, but it might not be enough to tip off most people, but the developer animation showcase is a different story. See, this video starts off normal, essentially showcasing, duh, the capabilities of Mario 64 and the limits of the Nintendo 64 itself. This video was uploaded in 144p, adding to the immersion that this really is some video from the 90s of the Nintendo 64's debut. Now, at first glance, it really isn't anything special until you start to listen closely at how creepy and slightly off-tune the Mario theme is, solidifying that something is wrong. This is more notable when Mario's drowning animation begins to play. Yeah, that's kind of creepy, but it's really nothing too bad, right? Well, maybe, until you read the description and realize that the animation for Mario used real human reference footage. So, does that mean 
This is actually a recurring theme in this ARG, this fear of the ocean and water, which is brought up symbolically throughout the channel's short-lived life. But the realism, and the creepiness for that matter, doesn't end there. There's this fantastic BIOS mock-up they do for the Nintendo 64 DD, and it is so aesthetically Nintendo and retro that it's almost like I'm watching a video from a parallel dimension, one where the 64 DD was actually released in the West and was super successful. Like, god damn, I'm actually in love with this BIOS screen. But then of course, we got that one creepy error screen. Right. Oh, but then we've got the render showcase, which has these wonderful renders that are so beautifully made and charming, and here's the spooky thing. Right. Honestly, I really commend the team behind this project for everything they've done, but I can't help myself from getting so immersed that I just forget it's a creepypasta-esque ARG to begin with. Really, it's not too often that I get to talk about an ARG that I actually really love and I think is very clever, very innovative, and very immersive. If you catch any of my streams, you know I really don't like ARGs because all of them are pretty much the same, but this one does a lot that I really respect and really love. If we go over to the community tab, there's even more details I haven't even scratched the surface of. At one point, Eric just sends a zip file that has a password that we can't really find out until someone figures out that it's Casey. Casey being a different character, I assume. And within these zip files, you can find a bunch of different articles that look like documents from a Nintendo work page or, or some sort of uh, documents that are very confidential to Nintendo and Argonaut software. And it's very, very well done. Like, this is like, it almost looks super real. And I just love it. Call me Nightminer or whatever, but I would absolutely talk for hours about this ARG. But I won't, unfortunately. And it might seem like I'm glossing over a lot of important details, but I will. Because in the back of my mind, I can't help but think that there's no point to it. This ARG has been cancelled, and all that effort into the story and into making the music, the creepy aspects of it, the wonderful yet unsettling renders, and everything in between crumbled in just a few months into the project. Someone who was working on the Super Mario Bros. beta archive actually revealed that the project was going nowhere. This certain someone is known as Mario Nova on Twitter, and according to them, they were incredibly screwed over by the creator of this project when they, without Mario Nova's permission, used the wing cap tower part of the ARG and just uploaded it on YouTube. Now, I won't get too deep into the drama that happened within the project and the infighting that took place as there's really not much info on it, but from what I've gathered and from what I've seen, the creator was treating the team unfairly. For all we know, could have been a massive prick about the whole project and kind of a douchebag. And seeing as how there was infighting and the fact that they actually used someone's content without their permission after they left the project, kind of shows that we might not be too far off into thinking such a thing. It's funny because you can actually see the rumblings of something negative happening behind the scenes when you go over to the community tab and read up on how Meg, quote unquote, had little to nothing to show and that there'd be weeks or weeks without content. It's no doubt that Meg during this part was pretty much playing a major role in just damage control. The last straw that really killed the camel was the last video they made, which was just Eric, I think, playing a beta version of the game. It really sticks out like a sore thumb because it doesn't really match any of the content previously. Like, it's not really creepy, and it's not very convincing either. As Mario Nova 64 had stated, what you saw uploaded just recently was lazily thrown together. And that's pretty obvious. I can't say for certain what happened during the development of this ARG or the management behind the scenes, but it is a shame that this had to end. There's actually more to this story that I, I want to talk about, like the encrypted zip files and also the unfortunate leak that occurred behind the scenes. But again, the series is over with, so it's not like talking about these things would change much of anything. There's no longer a mystery to be solved here. It's funny because the guys behind this channel actually went on to make a parody channel of this channel, and they called their channel the Ultra Mario Brothers Alpha Archive. 
And in no way was this some sort of creepypasta like ARG like the previous channel was. In fact, this channel has a completely separate character that constantly shits on Meg and Eric for ruining his lifelong career and taking advantage of his downfall to make YouTube videos. It pretty much mimics the beta archive channel and relentlessly mocks the project, pretty much hitting every aspect of it and making parodies of everything, right down to the creepy jump scares and weird 3D models and strange music. It's actually kind of funny, especially when you consider that this channel is run by a disgruntled employee that wants to ruin everything about the Super Mario 64 beta archive channel. Hell, I bet you can't even tell if I'm talking about the creators of this channel or the fictional character behind this channel. Either way, I, I think it was a spectacular run and possibly one of the most engaging and definitely the most immersive ARGs I've seen in a long time. It's a real shame that it never worked out, but hey, I hope this inspires someone out there to make their own amazing immersive ARG. Also remember, if you need help with making this sort of stuff, with any sort of project honestly, don't ever be afraid to ask people for help. There's a community out there always willing to help you out, whether you're into 3D horror, ARGs, or whatever else suits your fancy. Just be nice to each other, okay? Being a massive prick won't get you very far in life, man, and, and it certainly won't make you any happier.